And we're back again, guys. We've moved boards over here to the side, and we are looking at number 11, American government. In 1776, we do the Declaration of Independence, and we've got to answer some questions. The big questions of life, like, for instance, how do we govern this new place that we just created? And how are we going to do it well? We've talked about this needing to balance our natural rights with our classical republicanism, and we came up with the Articles of Confederation which is a really interesting concept because the Articles of Confederation are natural rights heavy. They want to keep individualism um, at the forefront and make sure that everybody gets the chance to be them. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, when it's out of balance, it doesn't always work out well. So, we said last time that this is federalism upside down and we need to understand what federalism is. So what I want you to do is I want you to take out a piece of paper. I'll wait. Okay, you're going to do federalism with me. Now, what federalism is, is the splitting up of, ooh, a little bit funky, but the splitting up of government, okay, within the United States, all right? So when you have a whole government like this, that is the federal government. It's all together. And that's where federalism happens, okay? So, one half is the national government. The other half are the state governments, okay? And even there, you can divide that state government half once more and find state governments and local governments, okay? People in Cody don't like it when people in Gillette tell them what to do. So, we have local governments, okay? People in Wyoming don't always like it when people in Colorado or California tell them what to do. So we have state governments. And then you have to put them back together a little bit with our national government, okay? President Trump, Congress, the Senate, our judiciary, all of those guys, national government gets to be the other part of that and we end up with federalism, okay? Unfortunately, this is federalism upside down. So when we split our paper, what happens is the big piece gets to be state governments, okay? And then we split up the national government side with the local side. So local is just as important as national, and then the states get to make all of the really big decisions, and that's a problem. So, what we end up with is a dumpster fire. Articles of Confederation, dumpster fire, right there. The 2017 word of the year, dumpster fire. Why? Because it's too weak. When you have a national government that's this size, trying to ask state and local governments local governments the same size, and state governments that are twice as big and more important for money to pay off debts for a big war that you just won or to even, you know, I don't know, put a letter in the mail and make sure it gets there or protect you with an army. You guys, do you guys think that these guys really have to say yes to that? No, they, they really don't. These guys are just going to be like, hey, hello, hey. Can I have some money? Please, can I have some money? I need to pay the tax collector. These guys just say no. It's a problem. So, if we can't pay for stuff, and we don't have taxes, we really don't have a government. Governments still have to pay for stuff. Remember, we protect surplus, but we use our surplus to help protect our surplus. That's important. So we have to make a new answer. And the new answer happens in 1787 with the new constitution. So in a constitutional republic, constitutions protect the natural rights or LLP in a nation state. How do they do that? They do it by limiting the government. They say what the government can and cannot do. However, what we're going to find out is federalism is going to be righted. We're going to have a larger national government, a smaller state government, 
and then a local government to come into it to be a federal government with our new constitution. And so it's going to work out really, really well because everybody's going to get the piece of the pie that they need through separation of powers and checks and balances that we have between our president, our judiciary, and our Congress to make sure that nobody gets too powerful, okay? We don't want a too powerful government because too powerful governments get into self-interest. Self-interest gets into tyranny. Tyranny doesn't give you safety and security, and without safety and security, you can't have empire because there are no happy people. And when there's no happy people, we have a right of revolution. Bummer. Next. What kind of voices are we hearing in this American Revolution? Well, we're hearing two kinds of voices. We're hearing the voices of conservatism and liberalism. Okay? We're saying, hey, maybe we need to hold back. Maybe we need to be a little bit more individual and take care of ourselves. But also, maybe we need to take care of others and be more giving. And so we have this constant balance of classical republicanism and common good with individualism and natural rights. And that's really, really important. So we achieve these things through conservatism and liberalism. Those are our two parties today, by the way, the conservatives or Republicans and the liberals or Democrats. Okay. And we achieve some of that other separation through federalism. It's how we have created this huge country that still works together. So we're going to lead from that to our third separate power, the judiciary. Because remember, any good republic has to have polity, one, the president, few, the Senate, and many, the House of Representatives, plus law to become a republic. So we had polity, we need law. The judiciary interprets our laws, and it gives us due process so that we're protected whenever we have an issue, and the courts will do the best job of making sure that we are either innocent or guilty, and given the right kinds of treatment while doing so. Something that's added back into this, wait a second, back into a connection to number nine with John Locke and the Glorious Revolution, habeas corpus comes back around. Remember, it was all the way back in the Magna Carta, and then in the habeas corpus act within the Glorious Revolution, <coughs> and we thought it was so important we put it in our Sixth Amendment of our Bill of Rights, those rights that we want the government to protect and or stay out of. So, what does that mean? We don't have to rot in jail. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty awesome to me. I don't want somebody looking at me and saying, boy, you know what, that Mr. Corbin guy, don't know about him. I'd like to put him in jail and just see him rot there for a while. I like having some freedom. I think habeas corpus does a good job of protecting my life, liberty, and my happiness. So, what do we end up with over here within our limited government is a connection back to 6 and 7. It still provides us some non-conformity or individual freedom. Remember, natural rights are good. <coughs> How do we have this? Where do we find it? Well, we find it in the First Amendment of our Bill of Rights, in the Constitution. So, we can find it with the separation of church and state, which is found in the Establishment Clause in our First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, and that is connected directly to the Acts of Tolerance from the Glorious Revolution in England and the Edict of Milan all the way back to Rome, because we are going to be religiously tolerant. Anybody know why we have a state called Maryland? It's for Catholic people, because Catholic people really feel that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is important. So they named a whole state after her. All right? Though most of us were Protestant in coming over to the United States, there was a place where Catholics could be and where everybody was going to be tolerant of the different religions around them. And that was a hallmark of the United States. Um, beyond that, we have some of our Enlightenment thinkers coming back around. And we see Voltaire, and he's talking about the freedom of expression, and he says something to the effect of, I may not agree with what you say, but I will fight to the death for your ability to say it. Um, and that is also in our First Amendment of our Bill of Rights. We want you to be able to say what you think and say it well. That's 
why we have history class, so that we can understand what's going on in the world around us, talk politics or the people's philosophy with other people, and have an opinion that matters. So, we had individual freedom, separation of church and state, and freedom of expression, but we're going to balance that with our classical republicanism, remember from three, and common good. Okay, that's unit two connections back there again to Greece and Rome. So, how do we do that? We do that by citizenship and civic duty. We are going to make sure that the people around us have a good place to live and are able to do the things that they need to accomplish to have a good life. Okay, and sometimes that's by doing volunteer work even. Um, you know, picking up trash on the side of the highway or, you know, holding a door for somebody that has a handicap or anything else that's of, of the above that's good for other people that can also fulfill some of those enlightened self-interest things that make you feel all warm and gushy inside. So, this is how we create an idea of enlightened self-interest. Okay, and I understand that this is difficult to see on the video. Maybe I'll try and move it up so that you can see it just a little bit better because there's a bit of a glare. But, there we go. We're seeing it. What is best for my community is ultimately best for me too. That is the definition of enlightened self-interest, and that's what we want in our world. So because we are able to so well balance our individualism with our classical republicanism, the American Revolution influences the world. And we'll see you for the French Revolution next time.